Even if Stan Lee wasn't encouraging of Ditko's experimentation, there were still plenty of reasons to enable it. Ditko's approach to comics was thriving, a rising wave of popularity that gave Stan the perfect impetus or excuse to bathe in the adoration of the countercultures he met on his promotional college tours. Increasingly distracted, Stan's grip on the wheel loosened, allowing Ditko, the agency, and space to become even more assertive, innovative, and bold. A rare and mutual success that would only tear the rift between them wider. Justice is objectively identifying a thing for what it is and treating it accordingly. No one gets the unearned. For Ditko, Peter Parker entering college meant the time for excuses was done. But when he pushed hard for Spider-Man to mature into his vision of an objective hero, Lee first shut him down and then shut him out. From Lee's vantage point, a man as philosophically rigid as Steve Ditko couldn't have been easy to talk to, especially in Stan's often compromised position as bridge between Marvel's creative staff and ownership. Now locked in a cold, silent war, often attributed to the same lack of credit, compensation, and control that fueled Lee's feud with Jack Kirby, the tightening of the perimeters around Ditko's philosophies would lead him to cast Stan's silence as cowardice. He now saw his work for Marvel, and with Lee with the same absolute division as the rest of his worldview. Spider-Man was his work, work which demanded either the appropriate credit or none at all. His work with Stan Lee now untenable, Ditko felt morally obligated to walk away from Spider-Man, but what then would become of Doctor Strange? As Strange stood firm, dead center of a swirling, mystic psycho sea, he became a thin metaphor for the kind of fortitude Ditko believed necessary to navigate the chaos of the 1960s. For someone who needs to bring about the world he believed in through art, idly watching the co-option of his extraordinary, idealized man must have felt like Bill Watterson stuck behind a urinating Calvin in traffic. Thus, in 1966, with the need for justice outweighed by his belief in self-actualization, Steve Ditko silently left Marvel. He'd taken the jobs, done and been paid for the work, and if someone objectively better suited were to come along and fill his shoes, they deserved the spot. With Ditko in what would become a lifelong retreat from the public eye, Lee was free to polish Spider-Man to a shine suiting his tastes. Either by mandate or simple demand, house styles of Marvel grew into favor, reducing much of Ditko's influence to subtextual tones and overt homages. But his stylistic influence transcends the superhero, leaving perhaps as great a mark on the indie cartoonists of the 90s, who worshipped the peculiarity and individuality in his work. As an essayist and indie cartoonist, his personal work is a large, self-published bibliography of unfettered, objectivist philosophy and vigilantism, a controversial, inventive, and lifelong statement.